We're on a mission from God. Wendy? Stay So I got that going. Darling? Looks like I picked the wrong week to quit sniffing blue. Light of my life. We enjoy your films. I am a human being. I thought they smelled bad on the outside. Welcome to Vintage Video, where we're rewatching the 80s so you don't have to. We'll be reviewing every major film release of the 1980s in real time, overanalyzing what you've seen and spoiling what you haven't. I'm Patrick O'Reilly. I'm Jesse Bayless. And I'm Richard Wells. And today marks the 40th anniversary of the release of The Competition on December 3rd, 1980. It was written by Joel Oliansky, based on a story by Oliansky and William Sackheim, directed by Oliansky, and released by Columbia Pictures. Anna Chlumsky was born today. Oh, she's happy wonderful. Birthday. Director Oliansky and producer William Sackheim almost simultaneously envisioned a love story against the backdrop of a world-class piano competition. They were working at the time with Raster on mostly television projects when Raster president Ray Stark commissioned Oliansky to write the script. Ray Stark earlier this year had a hand in the production of Somewhere in Time, It's My Turn, and Touched by Love. Richard Dreyfuss had never played a note of music on the piano when he was cast. That's amazing. It's pretty incredible. He practiced with the film's instructor four hours a day for two months. The full cast worked with the same instructor so that for authenticity's sake, the actors could be seen playing the pianos themselves instead of being strategically swapped out for Hands. inserts with expert I, yeah. musicians. Which was very effective. I mean, like, I feel like it makes a huge difference totally. in this movie. I, I was shocked by all of the shots where they would hold on the hands and then pan up to the actual actors playing. Yeah. And not that I wouldn't have respected these actors otherwise, but it's so much more impressive Mm -hmm. than them being able to memorize the lines that they could learn this entire life skill of playing these amazing concertos. And and I obviously I have no idea what real professional, you know, pianists look like when they're playing. Like I but it looked pretty darn convincing to me. The film was granted special permission to release early to make the Oscar deadlines and was nominated for two Academy Awards Best Editing and Best Music for the song People Alone, but lost to Raging Bull and Fame, respectively. So maybe they shouldn't have pushed so hard. It would have been eligible the following year. Mm -hmm. The film starts in a dark room where Paul Dietrich is pantomiming playing a piano on the top of a suitcase, but we're hearing the keys as he plays them. Yeah, my first note was Paul Dietrich, Richard Dreyfuss, Plays piano and I, my next, it's an ellipsis. Wait, oh wait, no, he's not. He's not, a not. He's not playing a <laughs> piano. <laughs> the phone rings and he thanks someone before hanging up. He takes a tuxedo out of the closet, shaves, and showers. We cut to a symphony performance where Paul is seated in front of a piano. His solo begins and ends very quickly. Looks like Richard Dreyfus is actually playing this bit. A representative of a panel of judges stands to announce the winners. Paul takes third place. His father encourages him to enter in the Hillman competition, but Paul doesn't see the point if he's finishing third in Cincinnati. Hillman is the Super Bowl of symphony competitions. His dad has complete confidence in him and asks for the medal to load it into the cabinet with all of his previous medals, presumably all second or third place. He announces to his parents that he intends to take a job teaching piano at a school. He's uncomfortable with his parents subsidizing his music career. His dad tries to talk him out of ditching his passion for a paycheck. His father claims that Paul's talents are God-given, and as he points to the heavens, Paul jokes, Who is he pointing at? Have you finally rented out my room? (laughs) (laughs) That was a good joke. Paul walks in on a piano lesson on campus, and it seems like a discordant mess. He waits for his dad to leave work before confessing to his mother that he's going to take one last shot at competing for this year's Arabella Hillman competition in San Francisco. He still has enough time to take this piano instructor job, given the schedule of the contest. Well, and I think it should be noted that this competition is like a young pianist competition. And so he's actually, this is the last year he can compete. He ages out of the eligibility in five months or something like that. We cut right to Greta Vanderman informing her student, Heidi Jones Schoonover, about the upcoming competition. They submit a tape of her work, and if she's accepted, she's immediately one of the 12 semifinalists. Heidi here is played by Amy Irving, who we last saw on the guitar throughout Honeysuckle Rose. First prize, $20,000, Carnegie Hall recital, and two years of concert bookings. Also a medal, which will turn your tits a lovely shade of puce. Heidi notices the cassette is past due, 
that Greta admits that she submitted a cassette of herself playing the Chrysleriana and just put Heidi's name on it. Seems like it undercuts your confidence in the pianist when you aren't willing to apply to the contest with her actual performance. Well, I think it was just a matter of timing. I don't think that she was not confident in her. But it's not like it was a surprise either. It's an annual contest. Yeah, it's a little strange. The only reason Heidi's finding out now is because they were accepted to the contest. So she's already (laughs) in the top 12. On the plane to San Francisco, Heidi pretends to play piano on a tray table, but has to consult the sheet music when she loses herself. The music again can be heard, despite the absence of piano, and it's a neat effect. I'm sure they had a pianist just match the footage in ADR because it's way too close to be the other way around. Mm Mm-hmm. Paul checks into his hotel for a week. Oh, I random I recognize this hotel. I couldn't believe I recognize this hotel. Just completely randomly. I have only stayed in two hotels in San Francisco in my life, and this was one of them. Yeah. But it was just like, this seems oddly familiar. Oh, you know, every every hotel in San Francisco mm-hmm. probably looks the same. And I'm like, but it's got this weird the the front room looks the same and the the weird stairs between floors look the same and so we finally we just like freeze framed on some of the best shots we could of the hotel and compared it, it to has the, the same courtyard the same view. pool and then we finally f- found a sign on the side of the hotel right the name in the 80s was the plantation inn was right it? the plantation inn yeah, and now it's and Casa now it's del sol a hotel del sol hotel del but sol but i actually ended up staying there and i was like that's weird but you said they actually used the rooms as his hotel room too they look the same everything in that hotel looks the same as it does now except the very center of the courtyard has been remodeled right. it's and because it's not for cars to drive on anymore yeah. at a much fancier hotel another competitor checks in with her mother or trainer or both i'm not clear yet heidi exits her cab outside the concert hall in reality this is the exterior of the san francisco museum of natural history outside the building she is approached by another of the quote-unquote 12 apostles he says he's from new york but Heidi avoids talking to him on advice from her instructor. He intercepts another competitor on his way in and introduces himself as Jerry DeSalvo. As they continue through the lobby, he tells the girl he was inspired to learn piano by a gay guy, though he uses a different word for gay guy, and uh, at the House of Corrections. So he's implying that he was in prison when someone told him to be a pianist? Is that what a House of Corrections is? Yeah, I think he says something later. Um, he lies to the press about having come from some shady background because right. he's trying to stand out. Yeah, but I thought he said something like a halfway house or something. I, I, he used a different term later right. than House a of Corrections. A reform school. Yeah, that mm-hmm. was it. That was it. Inside the building, we are now in the Scottish Rites Temple off Wilshire in Los Angeles, chosen for its flawless acoustics. Heidi sees Paul inside and seems to recognize him. It looks like I came a long way for nothing. Tell me you're not entered. I'm entered. You're so bloody good. I don't know where this bloody is coming from. She's not British. They worked together a couple of years ago, but it seems like Paul doesn't recognize her, and Heidi is embarrassed. Paul ducks into the restroom to get away from her and talks to himself in the mirror. That is the one they used to call Joni. You have no time for her. Anything that eats into your concentration even a little bit is no good. And he repeats this word for word three times because it's like his mantra of not getting involved with any of his competition. Paul practices the piano in a private booth with flickering lights. One of the other contestants, Mark Landau, moves down the hall past him to kick a girl out of one of the other practice booths because her time is up. Mark sits down at the piano and finds a key out of tune and opens the piano to tune it himself. I think this is meant to foreshadow that the girl he kicked out will not make it far in the contest if she couldn't hear a dead key on her piano and she's Mm -hmm. not paying attention to the time either. We get a quick montage of contestants practicing. Jerry and Heidi are in here. Then we cut to a completely naked man, Michael Humphreys, practicing at a piano in his hotel room. A representative of the hotel enters his room, seemingly aware of his nude piano habits to deliver paperwork. Uh, He picked it up from the concert hall and asks Michael to fill it out. Michael apologizes for not having cash handy to tip the man, but the man says that he tipped more than enough during his stay and that he doesn't need to worry about it. The phone rings and the hotel man picks it up. Mr. Humphrey's room. When Michael rises to accept the call, he shouts, Don't get up! In Tatiana's room, she argues with her instructor in Russian. We don't get any subtitles here, so I don't know what they were saying. I even turned the subtitles on on Amazon. It just says speaking in Russian. Yeah, I was Mm -hmm. like, I I guess guess we get the gist of it. They're... They're angry, yeah. or she's angry. Yeah, but it would be nice to have subtitles because throughout the whole rest of this film, I am super confused about yeah. whatever their subtitles. Their whole is. story is is very 
confusing yeah. until it's 100% cleared up. And so along the way, you're just like, what are these people arguing about? I have you no think idea. it gets 100% cleared up? I, I kept waiting for a, a shoe to drop yeah. of like, oh my God, something's going to happen at any moment, especially oh, getting ahead of ourselves. But towards the end, when the Russian guy just stands up and leaves, I was like, oh yeah. crap. Paul arrives at the concert hall the next day and Heidi stops him on the steps. She knows he remembers her and wishes he would respond in kind when she greets him. We cut to Paul's audition from the 12 contestants to the six finalists. His parents are in the audience. We see the Joan Cusack looking lady who didn't realize that her piano sucked. Her piece is very boring. So boring that a crowd of school children are let out by their teacher because they start roughhousing in the absence of interesting music. I don't know that interesting music would have changed their reactions I, but i think that <laughs> they're definitely implying that this is very slow the whole audience is just kind of like nodding off listening to it and then these kids start fighting because they can't pay attention to the music well then and one of the judges is just staring at her ass yeah well because michael's standing by the door and he tells her to get it over with because all the judges have seen her dress by now he doesn't say it loud enough for the whole auditorium to hear him but it's loud enough for the people near him and it comes off as surprisingly rude for what this is supposed to be come on mitzi get it over with they've all seen the dress but then we get quick inserts of a judge biting his lip looking at her and he's like aroused by her but then in the reverse angle of mitzi on the piano bench her dress is not at all provocative yeah <laughs> it's yeah. just like a completely normal piano dress that's what I would call it, a piano dress, unprompted by any <laughs> instruments. <laughs> Next, Tatiana plays a very complicated and competent piece. The two men seated behind her and her instructor seem very bored by this whole contest. And these are their, like, chaperones from Russia yeah. to make sure they don't escape from behind the Iron Curtain while they're here. The judges tally up their votes and the top six are announced. The principal conductor, Andrew Erskine, takes the stage and brings out the finalists in alphabetical order. Tatiana Baranova... Paul Dietrich, Jerry DeSalvo, Michael Humphreys, Mark Landau, and Heidi Jones Schoonover. Despite the conductor's request that the audience hold their applause, Jerry's family gives him an instant applause because they're very excited for him. The six finalists draw numbers from a bucket to determine the order of performance. Once they've all drawn, Michael tries to lighten the mood with a joke, but he's interrupted by Paul demanding to know everyone's numbers in concertos. All Michael's able to say before he's cut off is, Not after Paul heard the story about the two conductors. First conductor Who got number one? Excuse me. With some quick Googling, I think I found the joke he was going to say. All right. One turns to the other and says, was that your piccolo player I saw you rehearsing with last night? The other conductor replies, that was no piccolo. That was my fife. <laughs> huh? No. Everyone lists their concertos in order, and it looks like Paul is last. He and Jerry both intended to play the Saint song. Paul insists that the St. Saint is a wonderful showcase, but it belongs at the end of this finalist competition. Was that the argument? I that was what he said. I couldn't really tell. He offers to trade numbers with Jerry so that he can close with the St. Saint and Paul can perform something in the second slot, which is the, the performances are being split across two nights and right. he wants to be on the first night. Yeah. Well, I get the motivation for wanting to go sooner. I don't right. really understand why the other guy went along with it. Yeah. Well, because they didn't want to play the same piece. And uh, Paul said, I won't play this if, if, if you we swap. trade. Yeah. Because otherwise, a guy that he knows is better than him is going to play the same piece that he was. Or at least he's threatening to because right. he wants to switch. Right. And after him. So they can definitely probably, compare the yeah, two. Yeah. He, he probably had no intention of playing the Saint no, song. Of and he not. just picked on Jerry because Jerry looked like the biggest idiot of the bunch. Well, he was the noob. Jerry agrees to trade. And Dietrich says he's going to try the Emperor again which is something that evidently hasn't worked in the past. I'm assuming that's something that he played at a previous mm -hmm. in version of this exact contest, like a previous Hillman. Jerry shows Heidi their profiles in today's paper. All we can read of Jerry's profile is this. It was like Beethoven was showing me a way out of the ghetto. Jerry DeSalvo, 27, has no bones about what some may call a checkered past. And then the article continues... An immediate investigation is assured, and indications are that new light will be shed on the situation in the near future. Available facts seem vague, but authorities feel that time will disclose some means of arriving at a solution. <laughs> Which is all just vague placeholder nonsense. Um, everything after the introduction is just copied from a prop newspaper that's used in almost every production. Um, 
it, there's the same words appear in a newspaper in Goonies and Silence of the Lambs. Usually it's like literally the same newspaper page, but in yeah. this case they just replace part of the article with it. We cut to Jerry's family, upset about how cavalier he was with the interviewer. Apparently he told them he was the son of Sam as a goof. He was just trying to stand out. We cut to Heidi meeting her instructor at her hotel. They're headed back to practice at a friend's studio. Ludwig von Beethoven taught Carl Czerny. Who taught? Leschetizky. Who taught Schnabel. Who taught Rinaldi. Who taught me. And now the sixth pianist in a direct line from Beethoven is standing here staring at me in her Jordan Marsh mix and match. I lose the thread at Rinaldi, but I can confirm everything down to Schnabel on, on <laughs> Wikipedia. But as far as I can tell, the Josephine Rinaldi character uh, may or may not have taught uh, someone named Greta Van whatever. So Rinaldi was an actual pianist or no? I don't know if she's an actual classical pianist that trained with uh, Schnabel, mm -hmm. but there were search results for a musician named Josephine Rinaldi. So okay. I have to assume that that w could have been a real person and it's possible that she could have taught this fictional person how to play piano who sure. is now teaching uh, Heidi how to play. We cut to Heidi's piano test. They have four to choose from, and Heidi chooses one she's particularly unhappy with for some reason. Like, she sits down at one, and she's like, these keys all need to be revoiced. And they're like, yeah, they're not going to do that for you. And she's like, thanks, this one's great. And she well, just gets up and walks out. I think the best of the worst, probably. Like, it, she didn't like any of them, but of the ones that she didn't like. Yeah, but it just seemed weird that we only saw her sitting at one and trying one, and that she had specific complaints about it and then accepted that one. Yeah. Well, maybe she was distracted. That's possible because Paul walks in while she's doing this test. Mm -hmm. uh, he sits down at each of them to give them a test and calls out the contest rep for following him closely from instrument to instrument. The woman supervising the selection gets very pissed off at him for being so rude when he tells her to get out of his face and she leaves the room. Paul notices Heidi watching him try the last piano. They have their friendliest conversation so far, but it's over quickly when Heidi accuses him of lying to trade slots with Jerry. Paul selects the fourth piano and leaves to practice. He's performing a practice with the full symphony and starts correcting the conductor's form for some of his backing music. The conductor gets fed up with his requests and offers him the baton to conduct them himself. Paul accepts the baton and adjusts the orchestration slightly. It seems that Paul has actually improved on the conductor's form and the conductor leaves for a break, but the entire symphony begins applauding Paul for proving their conductor wrong in some way, or at least for standing up for himself. Uh, I don't think that that's why they were applauding. I think It was just that like, they, hey, you didn't fuck up. I, well, I think that they were applauding because he successfully conducted them, and it was probably better than what the conductor was doing. Yes, yeah, that's what I was saying. Yeah. Contrary to my wishes, this doesn't lead Paul to trading a piano for conducting as his potential career. As in, it's, that leads into Mr. Holland's opus? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this would just be the prequel to that. Mr. Dietrich's opus. We see Tatiana and her instructor get into a car in the parking lot when a blue car begins following them. Her instructor gets out of the car at a music shop, and just then the blue car skids up behind Tatiana's car, and her instructor runs for it, dives into this second car, and that car drives away. It seems she doesn't want to go back to Russia, so she just managed to escape through some family friends, and uh, Tatiana's handlers are all freaking out because they were supposed to keep an eye on both of these women, and they just lost one of them. Back at the hotel where they're staying, the two Russian chaperones argue over which one of them is at fault for this. Well, we should point out, this is not a hotel. This is the Russian consulate. Oh, okay. That's what uh, they're saying. So, I mean, uh, it's, it's, you know, probably a very secured facility. Yes. Um, but Tatiana is panicking because, I don't know, she's having some sort of an attack and they have to forcibly inject her with something to calm her down because I think she's just uh, very, very introverted and she had this woman here as, as her instructor but also as like a comfort, that yeah. someone who could calm her down. And when she disappeared suddenly, suddenly Tatiana's having a panic attack about it. The conductor is called out of practice with Heidi by a representative of the State Department. They tell him about Tatiana's instructor trying to escape Russian custody, and we cut directly to the conductor announcing a one-week postponement of the competition to the remaining contestants. He seems to... 
Why would the State Department tell the conductor? I don't know. That's why I thought there was so much more to this backstory, because you just talk about it as if this lady just doesn't want to be in Russia and she found a way to escape. But I thought there was so much more happening here Mm -hmm. that I was not understanding. I'm like, this whole competition was devised as a way to get this important woman out of Russia and she has state secrets. She's good. Like I had this whole story in my head and I'm like, I don't, none of this is true. There's a similar story in a West Wing episode where I think it's a, a Chinese musician is brought or a North Korean musician is brought to perform and wants to leave the country, but he's like the pride of his country. Mm -hmm. And, um, he passes a message to the president that he wants to claim amnesty, and then it becomes this whole thing where it's like, are we going to imperil our foreign relations with this country to let this person out? Um, but uh, it happens, and it happened a lot you know, in the early 80s, obviously. But I feel like if there isn't a deeper story happening here, that there isn't some sort of conspiracy or something happening, I don't understand why they are extending the competition. It's just, they're just being courteous to her and being To Tatiana. Like, they're just saying she's obviously... To recover. Yeah, but obviously Paul doesn't accept this either because they're saying, oh, you know, we she's under a lot of stress. And then Paul's like, yeah, yeah, we're all under a lot of stress. This right. is like a make or break contest right. that we're all in. Because for him, that he's got this artificial deadline of he was basically taking this week to do this competition and then he had to make a decision on his job right but it's a piano teacher at a public school that he was a shoe in for and if he called them to say i need to push back a week and then i can start I'm sure they wouldn't care. yeah they, there's no way they would care but he's definitely the least flexible guy in this room about it and it also means his parents can't be here to see the competition right. because they have to leave sooner The contestants tell him that the extra practice will be useful, and Paul fires back, if you're not ready now, then you have no business being here. Paul helps his parents pack to leave when his mother discloses his father's worsening health condition. This is the last year that could belong to me. That makes two of you. Implying that his father will be dying very shortly. Paul is instantly pissed off because apparently he regularly asks his mother, please tell me if there's any health concerns that I need to know about, Mm -hmm. and she always tells him, no, everything's fine. Paul sees them off and heads directly to Josephine Rinaldi's place, which is the place that they borrowed to practice at, uh, Heidi and Greta. Greta is still being a hard ass until they both hear a knock at the door, and it's Paul, and he wants to speak with Heidi. Greta is disgusted to see Heidi let a fellow contestant into their house. She knows exactly what this man's up to and wishes Heidi could see through it. Heidi agrees to head out for coffee with Paul on one condition, that he teach her how to drive on the way. She's tired of not knowing how to drive. Yeah, San Francisco is not the place for your beginning driving Mm -hmm. lessons. Especially (laughs) right after a rain. It's not not perfect. We'll just cruise over to Lombard Street and just go down that crazy zigzag. I drive perfectly fine, and I have no desire to drive in San Francisco. Also... It's pro- is it a is it a manu- is it an automatic car or is it manual? Because uh, I don't remember. I definitely don't want to drive a manual in San Francisco. Yeah. but she makes a right and then she comes to an extremely steep road that she's freaked out about. But Paul talks her through slowing down and they make it safely to the bottom. She asks what changed his mind, and he confesses that he got some bad news tonight, and she was the first person he thought of that he wanted to be with. They head out to a diner and eat all night before Paul takes her back to his room at his hotel. Not unlike earlier this year in Honeysuckle Rose when Willie Nelson took her out all night and then back to his hotel room. In the room, Heidi tells him that she's happy to be here with him but she doesn't think that they should make love and he says he's relieved. They kiss for a brief moment before Paul is crying. I'm getting you all wet. Teardrops on my boobs, great country western standard. He hasn't told her about his dad yet, I guess. Paul tells her how scared he was to watch his friend teach that shitty piano class at school. She tells him that she started on the cello, but it tickled her nose. Her brother was supposed to be the pianist of the family. Once she knows the whole story about his parents, she tries to talk Paul out of his guilt. You're not stealing their money. You're letting them love you. What are parents for if not that? They make love in spite of their earlier agreement. And we get one quick weird scene with the conductor smoking a joint. He's like, yeah. he's sitting on the floor of a room smoking a joint with Mitzi, who was disqualified from the contest mm-hmm. already. Yeah. And they're just listening to like experimental records. Yeah, and he's like totally into it. I was like, I, I, I kind of like that this is how he is in his downtime. Yeah. He's like this hard ass conductor, but really he's, he's just really- super flirty when he clocks out. Yeah. Um, and then for some reason, again, the State Department checks in with him. Yeah. Why is he involved yeah. in this? 
he has no no power other than maybe he's you know rich he's a member of high society and they just get connections they get heads up about things that are yeah. important more than the rest of us but it seems like they're talking to him like he's making any sort of decision about this competition yeah. mm-hmm. tatiana hasn't made much progress and may not be ready at the end of this week but he says i've got upcoming engagements i'm not pushing it back any further but there is some silver lining. The instructor has reached out and is requesting to meet with Tatiana. She just wants to explain her reasoning for disappearing the way she did. So they arrange a meeting. There's this really interesting uh, split diopter shot. Yeah, at the door. Yeah, at the door. It's like it goes from the split diopter and then dissolves back into the full. I think they just literally slid it out of the shot to the oh, right. Yeah. yeah. It, it didn't look good. <laughs> no, it didn't look good. It's but, distracting. But Because yeah. I, 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 I was like, if, if you're already just going to do that, just leave it the way it yeah, was. Just, just lock the camera down and yeah. shoot the shot like that and then don't use it for the next shot. There's no reason to make the adjustment mid-shot. But yeah, they bring Tatiana out to this park where she meets with her instructor and they speak for a bit and then they're separated again. But her instructor is like, now, where is she, is she back in the custody of the Russians? No, I, 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 because she's at the competition yeah. watching the performances. I, I was, again, just like I think Jesse was as well, waiting for something to happen. I'm all, someone's going to snipe one of these people and any moment someone's going to get shot. Well, way darker than I thought. There, I, I was at least sure that this competition was like rigged in her favor as like a, I'm sorry, Russian government that we screwed up well, and one of your people one is gone. That. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, like, uh, the conductor Erskine asks uh, Brundell or Brun Brundell? I can't remember how to spell his name. B- the State Department guy, Brun Brundell, yeah, which is the most cumbersome name to give a character. <laughs> uh, asks him if he feels like Scattergood Baines. <laughs> it's like, is that a TV character? Or it, something? It's a film and radio character. Okay. Um, but he says you feel a bit like Scattergood Baines, and that goes, yeah, I'm like. You both get this reference? <laughs> Who the hell is this guy? <laughs> yeah. Maybe in 1980, Scattergood Baines was more recognizable. Yeah. But for us, it's just like, okay, <laughs> whoever that is. We cut to Paul and Heidi playing the same piano over at Josephine's place, and Paul starts playing little music games with her. Suddenly, they launch into Hoagie Carmichael's Heart and Soul piano duet. <laughs> Greta enters to hear this and is not amused. She's convinced that Paul is here to sabotage her protege, and Greta says that she was snooping around the concert hall and has confirmed that the competition will commence on Friday with or without Tatiana. After Paul leaves, Greta relays her suspicions about Paul and reminds her of the competitive edge that exists in every contest. She tells Heidi, if you need to have sex, go have sex with Jerry. He's an idiot. He's basically just a vibrator. You wouldn't be cheating. And she's like, cheating on what? And she points to the piano and says, that's your husband. And you're cheating on it with this Paul guy. Yeah, she she likens it to being a nun who's married to Jesus. Yes. I I was, I don't know, and I, I don't know, this is my immaturity maybe, but I thought for sure that there was some kind of weird relationship going on between these two. Oh, Early on when, when, when they keep talking about her clothes and her boobs and like mm. and then this and this whole thing seemed like a very jealous uh, like, maybe argument like it, it seemed like almost like that there was a betrayal well i don't th- i don't doubt that she feels betrayed by her doing this but, but i don't not know romantically. that exactly yeah. i think yeah. it's just like look i've dedicated my life to this and you i thought you had dedicated your life to this yeah. and now you're showing me these moments of weakness that i find unacceptable yeah. i want you to take this as seriously as i do and i take it as serious as a heart attack yeah i i, I was reading too much into it but because yeah. she, she will tell a story later about the about a guy that influenced and wrecked her life right but she doesn't tell the whole story right because we're not uh, going to hear her story she but I, yeah i was i just wasn't sure because i don't know it was weird i i felt like their whole relationship was very strange yeah but we only have two characters who really have handlers and that's Tatiana and, and, Heidi. and Heidi. Yeah. And Everybody else is there on their own volition. Yeah. They don't have instructors in their suitcase. But they're they're maybe the youngest. No, I guess Jerry's pretty young. Well, I also think that they both come from a different world. And that was sort of the point that um, 
Uh, yeah, that's true. Because Paul's living in his parents' house potentially. I I can't I can't even get a grip on that if it's just they're paying his rent somewhere or no. I think yeah, I think they're completely supporting him. He doesn't yeah. have a job, so I think he's living with them and. And Jerry clearly lives with his family because yeah. they all came with yeah. him. And so I think that they just come from a different world that they can afford, you know, the the best of the best in structures. Yeah. And that... obviously Humphreys has plenty of money because he's just thrown it around his hotel yeah. as he plays his piano naked. Paul calls the school to withdraw his job application for the piano teacher gig. I feel like this should have happened later because it just takes a little bit of the tension out of yeah. the story. Um, but he says that if he has a fallback option that he will have he will put less effort into the competition but i still feel like like to jesse's point like or i can't remember who made the point uh that he he can still get this job if he yeah if he asked yeah he could get it next year he could get it a month from now it well, doesn't he could probably get it at any number of schools even this not just this yeah. one yeah um so i i don't know why he's so concerned about the pressure of this job maybe that's part of why they dismissed it here is because they were like this isn't really like a big deal so let's stop pretending that it matters that much i mean i think it is a big deal for him to just mentally give up on this dream and and resign himself to a job yes, that but part not is a big this deal. particular job yeah it should have been something that a, a, a larger opportunity yeah, yeah. like mm-hmm. like the opportunity to, to train some very specialized like kids or something that was like yeah, wow a this fancier would, school yeah this would be this would actually be a dream job but and then maybe it would it would seem like why is he doing this contest then if he could go right. do that something that yeah. he wants to do. They go to a party hosted by the contest and it looks like the press is there. Sitting around a table, Michael invites them to an after party on the night that they announce the winners. Whatever the contest runners are planning will probably be as lame as this. Suddenly, a drum roll rings out and conductor Erskine walks Tatiana into the room. Cameras are flashing and the press is crowding around her. Paul looks very dismayed, and he leaves, and Heidi follows him. Well, he kind of drags her out of there. Yeah. He's convinced that Tatiana's already planned to win the contest for the sake of this great press that they're getting. He shares as much with Heidi while driving like a maniac to Fisherman's Wharf. They argue while walking along the wharf until they catch the attention of a group of French sailors. These guys flirt aggressively with Heidi and clash with Paul until he almost gets in a fistfight with them. Paul has his fists clenched like he's going to do something, and Heidi advises him to open his hands so that he doesn't injure them piano-wise. Heidi manages to get the message through to the sailors with what little French she can manage, and they leave without incident. Once they're a little further away, Heidi accuses him of nearly getting her raped. I'm glad she called it out. Because yeah, that was it's infuriating like this was really stupid what you just yeah. did. Not for both of them. Yeah, but, you know he wasn't even thinking about the danger. Like he was fine. Endanger yourself, but yeah. look, I'm here too. He's still just upset about the contest, and she asks, what does this misbegotten contest have to do with you and me? And he says, what do you mean you and me? What does you and me have to do with anything? And she leaves. She just gets in a taxi and drives off. We cut to the first night of the finals, and Mark Lando is pounding out his performance. Jerry's family tries to applaud before the complete piece is over, and Jerry quickly (laughs) swings his arms out to silence everybody because he knows better. Yeah, because they're the only ones in the entire audience that didn't realize that it wasn't this wasn't the end end, of the song yeah (laughs) uh they move out paul's piano and erskine precedes him to the stage paul takes a seat and launches right into his concerto jerry looks worried in the audience and turns to mitzi who's having an almost emotional reaction to the music halfway through the conductor gives him a knowing look like he's doing something unexpected i can only assume they're changing the tempo or something yeah well i thought again for sure this was leading into Paul's suspicions that they he was they were going to be sabotaged, mm-hmm. and I thought when when you see all the the musicians kind of tapping each other's shoulders like this is the moment we're going to screw up or we're going to change we're gonna, the timing on him to, yeah and then cause him his performance to get a bad note. So no, I think they liked him and they were all professionals. It was just I suddenly he was doing things faster than he was supposed to. Well, it it I only I only bring it up because it seems kind of weird because then when Heidi performs, there's a similar issue. It seems like they're intentionally trying to sabotage these. Yeah. But I, it's but it's not the case. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure, though, because I really don't understand what this moment is. And I'm I, also a Philistine, so I can't tell what's changing about the music. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think that you can expect your audience members to really understand that here unless they're music experts. Yeah. Because it's, it's very vague what that look was all about. Yeah. But the orchestra keeps up with him 
and he finishes. He seems very happy with his performance, and he gets a standing ovation from the people in the crowd. The conductor urges him out from backstage to take another bow because they're going crazy for him. Backstage, Tatiana applauds his work, and her Russian handlers still look annoyed by all of this. In the lobby for intermission, Jerry buys Heidi a drink and tells her just how not worried he is about Paul's stellar performance. He confesses that he can only play the one song that he's playing for the contest. Look, I know I'm not fooling anybody. I can play one stinking concerto at this point. And if you want to know the truth, if I did win tomorrow night, I'd be in a hell of a mess. You can't exactly build a career on the Sansan's concerto. Not even Sansan's could do that. His goal is to rely on his looks and eventually star power. He points to De Niro, Pacino, and Travolta as inspirations. It's funny to include Travolta on this list because Joseph Cali, who plays Jerry here, was Travolta's brother in Saturday Night Fever and Amy Irving's classmate in Carrie. So they both had worked with him in the past. He points out that Liberace out earned Sinatra in Vegas, and he can play better than Liberace. So what are you laughing at? I shouldn't laugh. Yeah, go ahead. Out of hell with me. What are you doing later on? Where am I with you? A matter of pride? Hey, it's nothing like that. You're just, you know, juicy. What can I tell you? I'm not as juicy as I look these days. You'd be very disappointed. Listen, I... If I thought it would do either of us any good, I'd take you up on it. Trust me. They head back to Tatiana's concerto. And Greta finds Heidi that night contemplating pulling out of the contest to give Paul the opportunity he needs so desperately since she doesn't even care about the contest, really. She didn't even know about it until after she'd been applied for it. Greta tells her that every year someone else will need it more until she is the desperate one and she'll have to crush some 23-year-old guy's dreams so that she can get a pity win out of him. Heidi claims that she's not in the right mental state to play and blames... Paul's proficiency on the piano as though it were clear that she's already lost the contest and there's no point in competing. In the morning, Paul heads to Rinaldi's place to see Heidi, but Greta says she left already. She's not going to compete because she cares too much about Paul winning. He heads out of the concert hall and he finds her across the street at some like Ren Fair performance. Yeah, like a mini Ren Fair. Yeah, I don't yeah. know how he found her. Yeah, and I don't know why he would assume she went to the concert hall yeah. if Greta just told her that she quit. Like, I feel like he would have gone to... That? I don't remember her specifically saying that she was not going to compete. Well, she says... She's not here practicing. Yeah, that she left this morning, um, and then she, he, she says, you did a great job. It looks like you won. Like, you convinced her not to participate in the competition. And then he's like, that's not what I was trying to do. And she's like, sure, it isn't. I, you, I don't have to listen to what you say here because yeah, I already know what's going on. I don't think she explicitly on. says that she's pulled out of the competition. Yeah, I think though. she just implies that the fact that she's gone means that she's not going to be a part of it. Yeah. But when he finds her at this Ren Fair thing, uh, he goes up to her and yells that she should be practicing and that he isn't scared of her and not to do him any favors. And then as he's leaving, he realizes, oh, Christ, I did not come here to tell her that. <laughs> like, yeah. I was supposed to be supportive and convince her to go back to the competition, not just scream at her. Oh, Christ, I did not come here to tell her that. You know, you bring out the worst in me. He tells her that he's been lying by rejecting her romantic advances. He empties his feelings on her here, starting with day one on the steps when he said he wasn't interested in her two years ago. He says... He's completely in love with her, and he doesn't care how the contest goes. You and me is that we are a corporation. Now, if you win, great. If I win, better. (laughs) And if neither of us wins, then the hell with it, but the corporation goes on. And I wish to hell that I could have answered you like this the night before, but I just wasn't seeing straight. So I lied. I'll never lie to you again. She returns his affection. And he gets back to practice. I'll never lie to you again. He says lying to her. he lies. (laughs) She wants to make plans right away for what they're going to do after this contest. And they agree to use the week and a half between the winner announcement and Carnegie Hall performance to go on a vacation together. Michael does his performance and gets a solid applause. Backstage, Heidi waits with Paul when the conductor asks if she needs to take a piss before they head out. She's been to the john? Yes, sir. Well, up we go. Paul mouths, I love you, as Heidi turns to the stage. A couple minutes into her Mozart concerto, she's hitting the same dead key that she found when she tested the piano. She brings it to the attention of the concert hall by playing it out and then raising her hands from the keyboard like, you yep. heard that, right? 
Erskine tells her not to panic, they'll have a technician tune it right away, but she wants to switch pianos to the other Steinway. I'm out of the mood for Mozart. I'm going to play the Prokofiev third. Erskine is not happy with either switch. He tells them that the Prokofiev requires a whole different set of instruments, but Heidi points out that the musicians are here, ready to play Jerry's final performance. Switch the piano, switch the orchestra, switch the song. Running out of excuses, Erskine tells them he's simply not in the mood to play the Prokofiev, and Greta jumps in to attack. It costs extra to carve schmuck on a tombstone, but you would definitely be worth the expense. I was expecting them to just send Paul out to conduct the song, but, I mean, it would have made the scene a lot more interesting, but probably completely inaccurate. (laughs) So I was getting vibes here that maybe that Greta and this guy had a little thing going on. Oh, interesting. And maybe this was a guy that that interrupted her career because she seemed real familiar with him. Yeah. Maybe it's just they run in the same circles, but... But I was just thinking if Paul did conduct it, like, for her, if he was the conductor for Heidi's song, and, like, halfway through he realizes that she's better, but he just has to keep pushing the orchestra to be their best. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's no way they would let one contestant conduct another contestant symphony. What actually happens is Heidi nails the Prokofiev so hard that in the middle, Paul literally has to go outside and tear up for a bit when he realizes he's lost the contest. She gets the biggest standing O of everybody. We get a quick glimpse of Jerry St. Son, and the judges tally up their votes, and the winners are announced. Michael takes third, Paul second, and Heidi is in first place. Paul and Heidi are on the verge of tears for different reasons. Greta steps outside to jump and shout muted into the air in slow motion. This shot could have come completely out of the movie. Yeah, again, this is right after like the Russian guy like got up and left. I was like, oh man, someone's yeah. gonna get shot. She runs outside and jumps for joy and then gets hit with a car or something. Yeah, like I'm all something bad is gonna happen. But who does like this slow mo freeze frame kind of shot when it's not, not the end the of end. the yeah. film? Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, okay, it's over. I mean, I don't okay. necessarily like it at the end no, either. No, no. But it definitely doesn't belong in the middle of the third act. <laughs> don't just don't just cut back to a regular shot after this. It's weird. Yeah. Heidi drags Paul back to one of the practice rooms and they start to finalize their plans for the vacation. She realizes as she's rushing through the plan that his face does not match with her emotion. He tells her that she'll be a world-class pianist and this is an amazing start for her career. And yours, you got the silver medal? (laughs) Oh, I'm being stupid. There's no way you can't be disappointed and here I am expecting you to be nothing but happy for me and that's idiotic. I'm happy for you, Heidi. Here Paul confesses that the only reason he convinced her to get back into the contest was because he was sure he was better than her. Oh, you knew that I could play. No, I didn't. Not like that. It never crossed my mind that you would be better than me. He doesn't expect he can maintain a relationship with her, knowing that she's better than him at the thing he's best at. It would seep into my playing and bed and everything else. He tells her to go to the party and enjoy her night. She asks if he's coming, and he lies that he just has to call his folks first, and she sees right through it. Michael hosts a pretty chill party. He's hitting on Greta until she calls him honey child, and he doesn't like that. And then Heidi finally shows up. We cut to Paul breaking the news to his folks and prepping to leave town. Greta sees Heidi moping and urges her to the dance floor to get over this jerk that she didn't like in the first place. She dances lamely for a moment when Paul suddenly enters and gives her a dumb whoopsies gesture and he's apparently instantly forgiven because he moves across the Mm -hmm. dance floor and the two of them dance lamely together. And we get the names of each actor over each of the competition finalists and the conductor and Greta and then the credits roll over the party. Yeah, she's dumb. She shouldn't go back to him. He's totally right in that he won't ever be able to get over this. And and their relationship will suffer because of it. Mm -hmm. So this is just destined for failure. That is correct. Our writer-director here was Joel Oliansky. This was his first and last feature. He had mostly TV work. But in 88, he did write a Charlie Parker biopic called Bird, starring Forrest Whitaker and directed by Clint Eastwood. The story here was written by William Sackheim, who wrote features from the 40s and the 50s. His final screenplay credit was in 82 for First Blood. So that's a cool one. That's a good one to end on. Uh, Our DP here was Richard H. Klein. He was the DP on Camelot, Andromeda Strain, Soylent Green, Battle for the Planet of the Apes, the 76 King Kong, and Star Trek in 79. He lensed Touched by Love earlier this year, 
and he comes back after this for body heat all of me the man with one red shoe howard the duck and my stepmother is an alien editor david e blewett started his career editing documentaries in the 60s he's the one that got the best editing oscar nomination for the film but didn't take the statue in 78 he edited the buddy holly story with gary Busey. he edited in god we trust earlier this year and he'll come back for under the rainbow next year Smokey and the Bandit 3, DC Cab, Ghostbusters, which is why I recognized his name in the credits, Psycho 3, The Smooth Criminal Video, which we just watched that 60 frame per second yeah, up-res. So weird. <laughs> it's a little creepy. Our composer was Lalo Schifrin, or Lalo Schifrin. Uh, he has 218 composer credits, including Cool Hand Luke, Bullet, Kelly's Heroes, The Beguiled, Pretty Maids All in a Row, THX 1138, The Earth 2 TV Movie, Dirty Harry, Mission Impossible, the series, uh, Enter the Dragon, Charlie Varick, Roller Coaster. So far this year, he has composed When Time Ran Out, Serial, The Nude Bomb, Brubaker, and Battle Creek Brawl. So that's six movies for the year. <laughs> yeah. We'll hear his work next in Caveman for 1981. Yeah, we will. <laughs> and more recently, he has composed the 93 Beverly Hillbillies. Uh, he, he did all the music for that. And Rush Hours 1, 2, and 3. Richard Dreyfus played Paul Dietrich. It's Richard Dreyfus. <laughs> He's Elliot Garfield in Goodbye Girl. He was Roy Neary and Hooper for Spielberg in Close Encounters and Jaws, respectively. And he's Kurt in American Graffiti. It's also in Always for Steven Spielberg. That's true. Uh, he plays the writer in Stand By Me, Jack Noah in Moon Over Parador, Pete Sandich in Always, which I actually really, really like that movie. Always? Yeah. Yeah um he's dr leo marvin and what about bob he's mr holland and mr holland's opus he's krippendorf and krippendorf's tribe and he's alexander haig in the day reagan was shot directed by our friend cyrus narasta mm -hmm. amy irving was heidi jones schoonover she's sue snell and carrie and carrie too the rage she's lily and honeysuckle rose she's Hades and yentl she's miss kitty in five goes west and allison calloway in hide and seek Lee Remick was Greta Vanderman, or Vanderman. She played Betty Lou Fleckham in A Face in the Crowd. She's Laura Mannion in Anatomy of Murder. She's Catherine Thorne, Damien's mother in The Omen. And she's back as Maggie Stratton in Tribute later this year. Sam Wanamaker was Andrew Erskine. He's Carl Rosen in Voyage of the Damned. He played Rockford in the 78 Death on the Nile. And he was Teddy Benjamin in Private Benjamin earlier this year, Private Benjamin's father. He's also David Warfield in Superman 4, The Quest for Peace. That's where I know him from. Yes. I know him from Private Benjamin, because I've never seen The Quest for Peace. Joseph Cowley played Jerry DeSalvo. His first feature film appearance was as Joey, Travolta's brother, in Saturday Night Fever. This was his third, after something called Pinky, which also starred Amy Irving. Mostly TV after this, but he does show up as Nick the Nose in Suicide Kings in 1997. Adam Stern played Mark Landau. This was his only acting credit, but he's also a conductor on the soundtracks for The Gift, 13 Ghosts, Runaway Jury, Millions, and Ghost Rider. I think the first Ghost Rider, but I'm not sure. James Sicking was Brudenell. He's Harris in Scorpio. He's Control Room Man in Capricorn One. Ray in Ordinary People earlier this year. Sergeant Montone in Outland next year. Dr. Harold Lewin in The Star Chamber. Tozer in Up the Creek, and Captain Stiles in Star Trek III, The Search for Spock. He played C. Thomas Howell's dad in Soul Man, and he's also Howard Hunter in 144 episodes of Hill Street Blues. Delia Salvi played Mrs. DeSalvo. She was Ida Redino in Fatso and a Bel Air woman in Last Married Couple in America earlier this year. Priscilla Pointer played Mrs. Donnellan. We had her earlier this year playing Amy Irving's mother in Honeysuckle Rose. She is Amy Irving's actual mother and plays her in several films, including Carrie. She's also Mrs. Beaumont in Blue Velvet, Dr. Elizabeth Sims in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, and Mrs. Snell, the mother of Amy Irving's character in Carrie. Lori Main played Judge Wyeth. She plays Duval in Herbie Goes to Monte Carlo, Inspector Gregson in Time After Time, Mr. Mills in Freaky Friday, and he also provides the voice of Watson in The Great Mouse Detective. Hmm. Um, so I had one that was kind of an interesting thing. Um, 
so our costume designer here has a has a list a mile long of, oh, cool. of famous movies. Um, her name is uh, Ruth Myers. You know, she's done things like um, Emma, IQ, LA Confidential, Deep Impact. Uh, I mean, the, she's got some the Adams Family. She's got she's got ton, tons of great stuff in here. But the credit on her page that really stood out to me was Monster House. Because I've it's never CG, right? I've never seen a costume designer credited like a live action costume designer credited on an animated movie. Interesting. Because generally, your your character designers would have done that work. <laughs> yeah, but that one was motion captured, so maybe they were actually wearing stuff. I that's I mean maybe they were wearing stuff on top of it so that they could act to it. But I just think that that's it. It, it was just an odd. interesting credit yeah. to me. But it's the same as like Roger Deakins on Rango was on Rango. Yeah, yeah he was the DP on Rango. And it's like, it's a little weird to credit <laughs> the cinematographer when you could put the sun wherever you want. Well, I mean, he he was also a cinematographer on like all the dragon films, or well, at least the he he helped out on them as well. Yeah. But um, I I'm not saying there shouldn't be a credited DP. I'm just saying I wouldn't think of him to be doing that job. I would think that there would be a person who does that for animated movies and a, and a different people who and, do that for live action and, movies. And I can say and the same way. For and the I can costumes. say at least in terms of uh, what I understand from from dragons is he helped with it. He wasn't. Right. He wasn't. It was like an advisor. Or yeah. He exa- exactly. Exactly. And so maybe she was that too for for the costumes for Monster House. I just I, it just stood out to me as interesting. I've never seen it. Have you seen Monster House? Yeah. I've I've only heard good things, but I've never actually watched it. it it's a bit of a messy movie. Um, the, but it's Dan Harmon and like, yeah, but Dan Harmon is Dan Harmon has a whole thing where he's just really mad about how much they took of out of his story. Oh, really? Um, so he's he's not pleased with the project overall. But then, what is Dan Harmon? Yeah, he's never pleased with his own <laughs> project. But um, it, it's it is messy. Um, but uh, I kind of like it. Um, it. it I feel like I'm getting off topic, but it it will it does do one thing that really annoys me, and that's when a movie is produced with with the thought of it absolutely positively being in 3D, and so there are so <laughs> many reaching out at the camera, yeah, yeah just yeah. way too much stuff like blurred in the foreground, like that because I'm the not whole watching shot. it in 3D. Yeah, and I was like, I don't, this is so stupid. It's the same reason that Jaws 3D just looks like trash no matter what now, because the yeah. entire movie was shot with lenses for 3D. Mm-hmm. I'll have to ask uh, my coworker. He was the motion capture supervisor on Monster, Monster House. House? See, sure. See what, what kind of costumes this Were they wearing designed. coats that completely <laughs> covered all the ping pong balls? No. <laughs> I kind of doubt it. No, probably not. <laughs> she actually invented the ping pong ball outfit. Yeah. Actually, my coworker... <laughs> <laughs> invented the ping pong outfit he perfected a lot of the technology that's For currently that being used uh in motion capture so that's awesome. I, I'm, I'm not going to say that he invented all of it he might say he invented all of it but <laughs> <laughs> you'll leave that to him I'll leave, I'll leave the bragging to him but he did do he did do a lot for the technology in motion yeah yeah up or down jess <sighs> it, it's so middle of the road to me like it's hard i i, I probably wouldn't recommend this to anyone, so I'm not going to give it an up. It's not a bad movie, but it's there's. I don't feel like there's anything special here aside from the fact that the actors played the piano. Ditto. <laughs> I'm copying your answer. I, I don't think there was anything uh, standout special about this. Um, it's a perfectly serviceable romantic drama with a little bit of clutter to it, um, but the the story of the production and the fact that these people are all actually playing the stuff you see them play um that that's what sells it for me is the fact that we see their hands on the keys i think that's such a huge deal because the the first version we were trying to watch was a youtube rip that was slowly falling out of sync the whole time and i was like this movie doesn't deserve this we're gonna we're gonna rent this on amazon right now and unfortunately the week that we set up to record this it was free on Amazon like Monday and Tuesday, and then on Wednesday it suddenly became a <laughs> pay movie. So uh, if you got to pay if you want to watch this, but if you're gonna watch it, don't watch the YouTube one. Watch it, pay to stream it, and watch yeah. the perfectly synced movement of their hands mm-hmm. to the music. It's really incredible. Um, but again, I wouldn't recommend this to anybody. It's not my kind of movie, and it's not the kind of movie that the people I recommend movies to yeah. are interested in watching. Uh, where does this go? Letterboxed, Richard. What, Richard, up oh, or down? Did you up or down? I did not. Um, I'm actually going to give it an up. Okay. Uh, I, I enjoyed it more than I thought I was going to. 
Um, I may have had some bias in the sense that I was sp- mostly thinking about this really great anime series called Your Lie in April, which is also about a pianist in a competition. Um, and and I was just like, God, that was just a really great series. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just rubbing off on you the whole time. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm just thinking about that. Oh, yeah, this is kind of like what they did in that anime series, Your Lie in April. Um, but uh, I agree that it's it's just very, it's not bad. It's not great. It's not gonna it's not like of any huge of note movie yeah like but i think it's competently made and i think the research and the effort that went into everybody to get it made uh certainly shows um uh as far as like the actors learning the piano and yeah and uh there's like i think i read a story interesting story about sam wanamaker uh, really getting into the conducting, yes. So so much that the the orchestra was actually like taking their cues, from taking him. your cue, the wrong cues from him. <laughs> and they were like, "Well, Sam played the," and they're like, "Oh shit, <laughs> Sam's not the conductor. That's my bad." <laughs> um, uh, so I give it an up. Uh, it's it's a very it's a very light up. <laughs> All right. Um, letterbox. What are we doing, Jess? Um, it's kind of on the lower end of the movies that I think are, are decent. Um, I have it in 69th place. It is below somewhere in time, but above bad timing. Okay. It's between the times. Between the times. <laughs> uh, Richard. Um, I have it at 55, uh, putting it below raise the Titanic and right above die laughing. I have it in 87th which puts it just below Herbie Goes Bananas and just above Return of the Secaucus 7. Sure. I, ha- I had it in 104th Ooh. because <laughs> I was I was like, this is right on par with Nijinsky, but I would rather watch this over again, so I put it right above Nijinsky, and then I realized there's a lot of crap above Nijinsky, too, that I would like not want to watch again right away. I actually have it fairly close to Nijinsky, too. Nijinsky is 64, and this is in 69th. I, I think they are in a similar vein, yeah. um, but... That that area of my list is a little wishy washy because it's sort of in this section where we watched a lot of mediocre movies very early on in the yeah. podcast, yeah. and so I'd love to. That whole section's way out of order. Yeah, I'd love We're to do gonna a little tidy this up later. around Christmas. <laughs> but I think that's everything for this one. If you guys have any thoughts you'd like to share with us, we are Vintage Video Pod on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Letterboxd. Or as I've said before, you can find each of our full movie rankings for the year. We can also be found at vintagevideopodcast.com. Please consider rating us on iTunes to help people find the show. And if you take the time to leave us a review, we will thank you personally in an upcoming episode. If you're feeling especially generous, you can also support the show through patreon.com slash vintagevideopodcast. Thank you so much for listening, and I hope you'll join us next time when we'll be discussing... Dum, 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 dum. Flash! Uh, Flash Gordon, which IMDb describes like so. A football player and his friends travel to the planet Mongo and find themselves fighting the tyranny of Ming the Merciless to save Earth. <laughs>